And we're live. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another Van Hack webinar. I'm super excited to be here. My name is Ilya, uh, and today I'm joined by two members of the Commit team. We have Fong and Bear, who are with us to talk about their experience working remotely. Uh, as we all know, everyone or almost everyone uh, in the tech space is, is working remotely these days. Um, and they, they have a lot to talk about uh, remote hiring, uh, remote working, uh, and generally just the, the, whole, the whole subject here. So excited to get into it, uh, but before we do, we just want to do a quick mic check. Um, hi, everybody who's on the webinar. I uh, see we have Tadas, Holly, Emily, Rachel, Colin. Um, how are you guys doing? Can you guys hear us? If you can mention the chat. Um, hi, Jeanette, good to see you here. David, if you can just quickly say yes, or I can hear you in the chat so we know you're here and it's working, uh, and we'll get right into the content. Usually there's a little bit of delay. Sounds good. Okay, great, Colin. Thank you. Nice. Um, we're, we're live. It's awesome. Uh, hi, Vasak. Good to see you here as well. Hi, Holly. Um, so, guys, um, just one more quick thing before we get into the content is if you do have any questions, feel free to ask them in the chat anytime. Um, we might not answer it right away. Uh, we'll definitely circle back to it. Um, and we'll, we'll probably talk for another or for about half an hour, maybe 40 minutes. We'll see how things go. And then we'll definitely spend a good amount of time answering your guys' questions. We want this to be as interactive as possible. Um, so let's let's get into it. Uh, so yeah, without further ado, if um, you please have maybe starting with Fong and then Bear, just please introduce yourselves, um, talk a little bit about your career background and uh, what you're doing over at Commit. Uh, yeah, so you know, I've um, I've been in industry for about a decade. I graduated from the University of Waterloo. Um, actually, not in software, but more in like the hardware space. I was an electrical engineer, and then worked for a bunch of companies from uh, big corp like AMD, Qualcomm, IBM, and then slowly moved into the software space. Um, and really got into the startup space when you know all this whole like iOS mobile app hype came along, and then. Um, been entrenched in it ever since, and you know, been you know, just going forward, learning everything I can, and trying to start a couple of my own companies. Failed a bunch of companies, um, and you know, what better to learn how to you know grow a company, build a company from a startup, uh, than to learn from the best of the best. And you know, that's why when I met Bayer, I was immediately um, entranced by you know his successes and everything like that. And he told me about Commit and the mission that we're trying to to achieve, which is to make um, the engineering career experience 10 times better. Um, and then ever since then, you know, I've been a commitment in trying to grow out the presence over here in Toronto. Uh, Bayer is over in Vancouver, so just trying to help out there and then build some internal tools, things like that. So that's pretty much where I am right now. Very cool, thanks, Fong. Um, and Bear, how about yourself? Yeah, uh, first of all, thanks for uh, for having us, Ilya. This is, uh, like remote hiring and working, that's uh, that's a pretty su that's a super fun topic to talk about right now, especially given what's going on these days. So so yeah, so my, my name is Bear. I've been a kind of tech entrepreneur, like soft engineer, tech entrepreneur, pretty much in the past fifteen years. And um, you know, throughout my time, I've uh, helped companies going from like a few employees and help them build out and scale up to over a thousand people. And I've also built out my own company and sold them later on. So I think through my experience you know as a software engineer as a as a kind of architect as a senior management you know like one consistent problem that i've seen and it keep, keeps getting worse is essentially you know on one hand it's becoming increasingly hard for startups to attract and retain talents especially software talents and then on the other hand it's becoming harder and harder for software engineers to find and join startup opportunities for a lot of practical reasons, you know, like financial risk and vetting risk and whole recruiting funnel, which is really kind of hard and, and, and stressful and hard to deal with. So that's when I decided to build a business to solve these problems for the engineers and um, and the startups. And that's why we can we build commit to connecting high, pot high, high caliber engineers with high potential startup opportunities. So yeah, so that's a bit about myself and uh, the company Commit. Awesome, yeah, what, what I really like about what you guys do is um, when, we, when you first told me about the idea is how you help people who are maybe more uh, risk averse. Uh, let's say they're comfortable at a large company and you help them take that risk without it being as hard. Um, so I thought that was really, really smart, unlocking that kind of trap talent 
Um, so very, very cool. Um, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Um, so, so yeah, guys, uh, what, what, um, maybe prompted you or how long have you been doing the remote hiring, um, process, um, maybe some background on that, please. Yeah, well, I can, I can go first. So, so I mean, uh, throughout the years I've been hiring kind of remote engineers, you know, kind of like here and there, like not consistently, it's just like here and there for, for quite a few years, you know, through my company at through you know my my time at Hootsuite and then my last company and the current one like sorry the last company but really started uh, at commit you know since we started last year um we decided to just go full on remote everybody we hire is remote and uh yeah so so really that's kind of been uh, uh been, been our experience and I, I think what prompt prompted us to, to to go that route is it's just so much easy like like re hiring remote engineers, you know, it, it increased your talent pool. So it makes it easier to hire people. So I think that's, that's, that's the most, that, that's the most important reason for a lot of people. But I think from my perspective, it's actually not that. I think part of it is just like, I have a, a over the years, I built out a network. Hiring engineers is not that hard for me. But, but what, what I'm really intrigued by remote working is, you know, what I look at the, fu the, fun the, fu the, the fundamentals where I, be I increasingly believe building a remote company is really just about building a good company, a great company. And that's actually the factor that attracted that attracted me attracted me the most. And that's why we decided to go full on remote, you know, from the very beginning I've come in. Hmm, interesting. So so what what about remote allows you to make the company uh, a great company that maybe a co located team would be limiting? Like what are the advantages in your mind? Yeah, like I you know there's a lot. I mean I, I would say you know, working remotely, it forces you to think about how you structure your organization differently, how you, you know, how you communicate within an organization differently, and how you treat people differently. You know, mm -hmm. like, yeah, so like, I think it makes you more resilient. And, uh, you know, it, it really embraced the whole thing about idea and meritocracy, because now decisions are not made in a small room within two, between two people anymore. It's really you have to structure decision making in a more transparent and visible way, right? And now, and also, you know, because of because of a lot of, because of that, it makes you way more resilient. So, so you don't really just rely on a local talent market. You're really relying on the global talent market. You know, like when when things get tougher in Vancouver, say, you know, ten years ago, hiring engineer in Vancouver is, is pretty. It's not hard. But today, mm -hmm. as, you, as you know, it's extremely hard. And mm -hmm. if you're stuck with just the Vancouver talent market, then uh, you're not doing yourself a favor, right? So this has become more uh, uh, resilient. And I think it also promotes this whole diversity and, and inclusion. You know, like think about, you know, you are now your talent pool is across the world or different culture background. You're forced to really think differently when it comes to diversity, right? And also make it more inclusive so that people are not you know, in the office, making like making decisions in the silo is you're, you're, you're really making visible that people can participate, contribute their ideas. And uh, yeah, and that does really help the company overall. And imagine when you have all this and remote being like, you know, a, 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 a catalyst to make all this happen, you're going to have a good company, not just a good remote company. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so true. Um, I think more and more people are realizing that, uh, yeah, if you're not working remotely, I guess everyone's kind of forced to now. And I, I think a lot of people are saying that, hey, it's not that hard. It's not that different. And it's actually a lot better in many ways. So I'm excited about this trend and think it's going to uh, just go, you know, keep growing from, from here on out. Um, but there are some challenges that happen to it. And, and one of them can be, um, you know, it is a little bit harder to have the interviews happen because of time zones or internet connection or, you know, some maybe a little bit harder to have miscommunication uh, or easier to have some mis miscommunication. Um, what, what tips do you guys have for remote interviewing? If you're, you know, you want to hire a developer, you have an interview scheduled, what can you do as a company to make sure that that process goes smoothly and you're able to really assess that candidate's skills, uh, in a good way? We, we've been experimenting with a lot of different things. Like, um, you know, a lot of people like to take the whole traditional process of whiteboarding and throw it up into the digital world. Um, that gets a little bit crazy because, you know, you come here, um, and you suddenly have to do all the traditional things, but now you have the whole, 
you know, disadvantages of being remote. Like, you know, maybe there's an internet connection problem. Maybe you don't have um, that feeling of writing on the board and you have to use your mouse or something like that when you're doing whiteboarding. Um, and so here at Commit, we're just trying to change it up a bit. Um, we're not looking so much for hard, hard technical skills. You know, we, we look at that, but then we like more of the potential to grow. So, you know, we dive, we take a more verbal approach when we do our interviews. We want to see, you know, the culture fit of the engineer, uh, if they can go mo both broad and deep mm. into the projects that they've been doing. You know, can they talk about the tech stack? What did they make certain design decisions, things like that? Um, and you, you can pretty much tell, like, you know, are they really into engineering? Are they really into this whole product space, this whole startup space versus, oh, yeah, I'm just trying to go through the day, do my nine to five and get paid kind of deal. And, you know, at Commit, you know, we want to help connect uh, the best engineering, entrepreneurial engineers with the best potential startups, right? Um, and so we really need to take a step back and just change this whole paradigm of interviewing. Um, yeah, so things yeah. like that. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I think the, the interesting thing is the because of the lack of uh, you know uh, uh, you know like capability to do like you know coding sessions and 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 whiteboarding sessions and and, and all mm -hmm. that stuff. You know, I think it's doing us uh, doing doing everybody a, a favor, like the employer and the candidate. Because I mean, I've been inter I've, I've interviewed hundreds of hundreds of people, and you know, as an interviewer, as an employer. You know, like I, my mindset is, oh, I can't hire the wrong people. So, mm -hmm. so I, I design everything, you know, and make it as hard as possible. So I don't have a false positive, right? Mm -hmm. And because of that mindset, which I think a lot of employers share, then uh, you, you make it so hard and, and it becomes obscure. You know, like it doesn't make sense anymore, right? Like the whole interview experience becomes very stressful and negative. And and it doesn't really help you to actually find the right people, right? Mm -hmm. So so okay. now you're re removing all these kind of coding sessions, mm -hmm. which asking you know weird questions that has nothing to do with the job, you know. Now you are really just focusing on you know the growth mentality, the soft skill, which I think is really the most important part, you know. Than the you know sometimes even more important than hard skill itself, which can be learned along the way, right? So I think mm -hmm. remote interview. It kind of helps with that, but I, but I think at the end of the day, um, remote interview is not really that different than traditional physical face to face or, like oriented interview. If you think about it, you are mm -hmm. still gonna you know building relationship, getting to know each other, but most most importantly, evaluate skill set and you know a soft or a hard skill. So that's that's pretty much the same. The differences are you know nominal. Like before, you have to schedule a meeting and the, and book a, a physical room. Today you're booking a Zoom meeting, right? Yeah. So I think I think I think I think in in terms of that, you know, you still need to prepare as well as you can, just as if you're conducting a physical interview, but but also you know leverage the online you know uh, uh, approach to, to actually uh, and 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 take some advantage of that. For example, I I found that you know being doing conducting interview in the physical small room it makes mm -hmm. everybody no nervous. Even the interviewer, the employer is still pretty mm -hmm. nervous. It's really serious business, right? And it's very hard to build a personal relationship to build a bond. But but you know, a remote interview, you know, engineers like or the candidates usually are online, most likely at home. It's a very you know a friendly environment they're familiar with, and they're more it's easier for them to open up. So I think you know using that opportunity to really build some personal relationship, find some bond, and I think you know. Uh, um, you know that that makes the whole interview process much more pleasant. Make mm. people more open. That you can ask deep, deeper questions. That you can get some answers for. And uh, most importantly, you know, this is like a, a, a seller market. Like what I mean by that is, there's way more uh, opportunities than available engineers. So mm. you really want an engineer to join you. And one yeah. approach is to build that personal relationship, so they feel really <clears throat> good about that, right? So I think yeah. remote remote interview gives you opportunity mm -hmm. to uh, to enhance that experience. Interesting. It's funny how going virtual and not being in the same room allows you to connect in a deeper way than sometimes if, if you were actually in that, in that, in that same physical location. Um, it's counterintuitive, but I, I get it. It makes sense. You're kind of on the lane level playing field. You're both on your laptops. You have kind of the same, the same, um, you know, or as closer to the same because there's a little bit of a power dynamic of someone offering a job or someone 
looking for one, but maybe at the same time, there is a different power dynamic of someone who's looking for a job has five offers. So you're kind of as a disadvantage. So it's, it goes. Yeah. Really, yeah. It's, um, I, I, yeah. And this is one of the reasons why, you know, even before remote, like, you know, a lot of companies, great companies, they conduct, they conduct interviews in the coffee shop, you know, mm. other than uh, in a physical mm. small room within mm. the office, right? Because cool. that's what they are trying to create that environment. Now we get it by default by doing remotely. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, that's actually really cool. Um, quickly, just want to acknowledge Rachel uh, answered a great question here. Um, and I just want to say, anyone, if you guys have any questions, uh, we're, we're here to answer them kind of as, as we go. We do want to you know, interact with you. You did take your time to be here with us. So please, um, you know, if there's anything on your mind, Rachel asks, what would you say to hiring managers who feel you aren't able to assess people as well virtually as you could in person? So I'm guessing Rachel is working in HR and she has some people on her team who are maybe a little bit anti virtual interviews. Um, what would you say, what, what could Rachel say to her hiring managers to maybe get them to be more open-minded? Oh, uh, phone, we can't hear from, from you. Yeah, well, while he's fixing that issue, I can take a step first. So, um, I mean, like, I, I think, I think it's really case by case, you know, like everybody has to look at what are the top one or two things that they are uncomfortable or fearful. Like, well, well what would they feel they're missing out? right by by conducting interviews online and and then you do some research on see how other companies are doing that i guarantee you it's a very much solved problem like the problem they are facing is nothing unique at all right so 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 i think i think it's really just about you know taking a leap of faith you know be open minded and uh you know as long as you're willing to give it a try and do some research like the problem you are facing the concern i have is I can guarantee you it's not unique. It's somewhere online. So 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 yeah. So that really depends on you know each recruiter or interviewer what they are feel, what do they feel they are missing out, and do some research on that. You know there's gonna be a solution. Yeah, and and the thing I can say about this is that you can't be, uh, you know, one foot in the water about this kind of thing. Like it's the same thing about just remote work as a whole. There are people that say yeah it can work or yeah it can't work, but then they're forced to do it now. And it's not working because, you know, they, they, they're like hesitant about it and they're not fully embracing it. Right. It's the same thing with it in the, um, in, in the hiring process. Like if you think that you cannot assess properly because of this whole virtual environment, you're not going to do well. Right. And I can guarantee you, if you have the same mentality in a physical space as well, then you're not going to be able to assess well in that situation either. And I can guarantee you that, you know, the people who, who are saying that, you know, they can't assess virtually as well as they can physically, like look at their track record and the people that they hire and the talent that they hire um, back in, you know, the physical space and just see what the level of talent is, you know, where the hits, where the misses, how are the people who made through probation, things like that. And there's not going to be a difference between, between um, physical and virtual. Yeah, definitely. And uh, Rachel, one thing I would say is, you know, look, look at what some of the best companies in the world are doing right now. Um, it doesn't have to be the traditional remote companies like Envision and GitLab, uh, but look at what Amazon's doing. Um, I'm guessing Facebook and Apple and, and Google are all hiring people remotely and doing virtual interviews as well because they're, they're forced to, right? Um, so if your hiring manager is not as comfortable as the hiring managers at, let's say, Amazon, um, why not? You know, the, isn't Amazon the most valuable company in the world or one of uh, Microsoft, I guess? I don't know. It goes back and forth. But right. Um, that, that that's what um, I, I would maybe ask. And if there's a specific thing, like I think Bear said, what what is that specific thing? And maybe we can uh, help um, change their mentality um, quickly before we go to the next questions. And I see Tadas and Jeanette for your questions. Thank you for those. Um, I, I was curious, guys, if you guys can maybe take me to that that moment in time where you had that mindset mindset switch from okay, you know what, maybe remote hiring, remote work is an option. Was there something specific that happened that kind of got you to say, hey, um, this actually isn't as hard or it's actually better, et cetera? Yeah, I, I think I think for me, it's, uh, I wouldn't say there was like one moment and boom, everything changed. I think for mm -hmm. me, it's very gradual. Mm -hmm. Over the past, let's say the past three or four years, um, you know, the analogy I would give is like, and I, I, I'm not sure if everybody is familiar with the concept of a DevOps, you know, essentially combining engineering and operational together as a cultural practice and all that stuff. So, so, so back in the early 2010, like 2011 or 12, you know, like I, I learned about DevOps and from the Phoenix project book. 
And then uh, gradually I started believing in it. And then I see more people, more, comp more companies adopting uh, the DevOps approach. And they started kind of, you know, implementing that within the company like Hootsuite that I'm working at. And uh, and now, you know, like DevOps is a default, like, you know, it's just like, it's not even a question anymore, right? Mm. So so I look at remote, it's kind of, I, I felt like we we're in a similar time where there's a lot of pioneer companies like, you know, GitLab you mentioned, and then uh, later on like Stripe, right? Stripe set up their new HQ, you mm -hmm. know, not in the physical place, it's like the whole world, right? Yeah. So, yeah. so so I think, you know, I feel like, you know, we are, we are in the, like the second wave of this whole journey. And, uh, you know, in the future, you know, going to see uh, it's going to grow exponentially. So, so I think for me, it's more like, you know, the influence by the pioneers and gradually by other companies adopting this. And then fundamentally, this is something I really believe. And to a point where, yeah, I'm going to pull the trigger and just make it make everything by default, by uh, remote by default. Awesome. Awesome. And I pasted a link to the blog uh, that the CTO of uh, Stripe wrote about there remote uh, hub, their, their next uh, engineering hub being remote. I think that that's that's really cool. Uh, Fong, uh, same question to you. Yeah, I mean, for me, uh, it, five years ago, I was working for IBM. And, you know, ever since then, I've been um, in the open source world. And you meet so many people in the open source world that are just from everywhere in the world. You know, like, you know, we usually think the best developers are within like America or Canada or something like that. But there's a lot of very very talented individuals who are in other countries who are looking to get into you know, the best startups and things like that, but they're just not able to because maybe their country doesn't have that good of a tech industry. Uh, and so when I was at IBM, we acquired a company called Strongloop. And, you know, I met this guy from Czechoslovakia and he was something like six hours away from Toronto and from the rest of the team, he was like nine hours away. So how did that even happen? But this guy was like a beast of a developer. And, you know, what I learned from him was that, you know, it doesn't matter um, where you are. There's talented developers everywhere. And so, you know, that was sort of like the catalyst in me looking into, uh, you know, first the open source world and secondly, you know, remote work and things like that. And back then, this was like 2014, 2015 or something like that. And there weren't a lot of options for remote work. Like, yeah, there is a couple that has a couple of companies that have some like remote positions, but they pretty much um, treated those positions as contractors, something like that, not like fully part of the team. But then now today, you just look online. There's so many options like on remote.io, remote OK, and there's all these options. It's just the way to go naturally for the tech world to go fully remote. For sure. Yeah, it's it's a it's great to see. Um, I think the you know the, the pandemic definitely accelerated the trend. Um, and say to see where where, where we we are after. Um, so Jeanette asked a really good question about what uh, what are remote workers looking in a company. So um, we talked a little bit about how the, the best engineers have a lot of options. Um, how do you attract them? And then what about this uh, benefits um, situation? How do you deal with benefits? Yeah, um, I think for, for, I mean, like for, for remote, um, sorry, just make, just want to make sure I understand, like, is it an engine from engineers angle? Like what, as engineer, what do I want to look for from a company or as an employer, you know, how do I attract remote engineers? So I just want to clarify the question here. Um, I would be, uh, how to attract remote engineers, um, and, you know, make sure that you're, yeah, you're giving them as many benefits and just be, being as, uh, attractive, uh, what, yeah, as possible. What, what, what's right. important for them? Right, right. Yeah. So, so I think, I mean, first of all, you know, being open to remote, right? <laughs> so, like you, like the, I, I think fundamentally you can do a lot of things. You can give better benefits. You can increase the vacation time or, or one of those things like, you know, you know, unlimited vacations or, you know, like, you know, just like the, all the perks you can offer. But I think fundamentally, if your company from the inside does not have a remote culture and practice, none of, none of the other matters. So I think, you know, I, I, I would uh, suggest, you know, if you are transitioning from a traditional physical, physical office space into remote working, pay a lot more attention to your internal culture and practice, you know, and processes uh, um, and, and build on that first before, you know, thinking about the perks that you can attract engineers. Because the thing is, once you attract an engineer, 
they come in, they see everything is totally different, this is chaotic, they're gonna just leave anyways. And you're wasting mm-hmm. your whole cycle hiring and 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 getting and then people leaving, right? So and and also, you know, um another thing is working out loud. You know, as you you know look inside in building really a great culture and practice about mm-hmm. remote, you share that, you know, on, on your engineering blog or you know on LinkedIn, whatever channel that you have. And uh, you know that naturally will just attract more people to, to come to you. I like yeah. that. working out loud. That's yeah, cool. for me, like I see uh, after talking to like hundreds and hundreds of engineers, there's three things that they look for when deciding what their next opportunity is going to be. One is compensation, which is fairly obvious. Uh, and depending on the size of your company, you might not be able to compete with Amazon or Facebook or Netflix or whatever. Like they can pay the top dollar. Um, and if you're a startup, you really can't do that because you're going to kill your runway, right? Uh, the second thing is the product of the company, the product and the stability of the company. And so if you have a product that's not really defined and you're wishy-washy and you're throwing away a lot of work, like, I don't know, one week you're doing one thing and the next week you're doing another thing, like engineers are going to be very, very upset about that because, you know, the worst thing to an engineer is just like doing work and having it thrown away too many times, right? Um, and the third thing is what Blake Bear said, culture. When you have a physical office and you're a startup, there's a lot of things that are fun about the office. Like maybe you have a ping pong table, maybe you have, um, you know, get togethers, lots of events, things like that where people are happy. But with a virtual environment, you no longer have any of that. All that is lost, right? Mm-hmm. And so you've really got to build that culture in another way. Like yeah. maybe have these one-on-one chats um you know maybe gatherings every now and then just to not really talk about work and just to sort of simulate that kind of water cooler talk and just you know maybe play some online games maybe like a virtual board game session or something like that just really build that culture of of uh you know working on the right stuff um being friendly with each other no ego kind of culture um Mm -hmm. and just moving forward with that like really get that down to the fundamentals very cool yeah we um we're having our Virtual happy hour uh, tomorrow that we have every couple of weeks. On nice. Our um, and uh, we we have we just installed the random coffee app uh, on Slack, so it just does like a random pairing of people. Um, so a couple of things we're, we're we've been doing um, that that have been helping for that. And I think, yeah, that that's that's a huge thing uh, that you can you can show potential employees. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Jennifer, yeah, for your question. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're, yeah, we're actually trying two tools as well, and one is Icebreaker. Oh, yeah. The icebreaker is pretty. Uh, we tried it last week, and then yeah. another one is the donut, which is essentially yeah, like, uh, like, like 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 random coffee, yeah. like pairing people up and just yeah, build build out that relationship, right? Yeah, yeah. Donut must be going uh, doing really well because I've been hearing their name a lot as well. These days. Yeah, there, there. I mean, here's the thing, right? There are hundreds, if not more, companies out there. All they do is building startups to build tools for remote working. Mm-hmm. Right, you know, there's there's this is like there are many many people and companies solving this problem right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, Basak, I'll, I'll share the yeah. Basak's asking for the icebreaker link as well as the random coffee app link. Um, I'll, I think it's random coffee Slack. You can find that and share, share that out too. Um, happy to share these kind of practical tips. Um, so if anyone has any specific questions like that, please let us know. Basak also asked a good question uh, about best practices um, doing, they say, she says, we do daily check-ins um, where they don't talk about work, but they're having a hard time to find things to talk about. <laughs> so everyone's well, kind of well, that, Yeah, that, that's what Icebreaker does, you know. Okay, it, it, great. it connects you, it, it generates random topics that you can, you, you can control to a certain degree, but it generates random topics that you can chat about, right? That's, yeah, they, they, they need an icebreaker for sure. Yeah, I mean the, the thing is that also you, there's such thing as like Zoom fatigue. I mean, if you guys haven't like read the articles all around, like it's all over. People who kind of just jump on Zoom calls just for the sake of you know having that face to face get fatigued really quickly. And so if there's really nothing to talk about, like you don't really need those daily face to face. Um, you know, especially if you're kind of forcing it. So if it feels forced, don't do it. Hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. Um. I try and take my Zoom meetings into into chat as much as possible, um, and, and like, yeah, um, if if people need to do a call, well, let's just quickly chat about it. Maybe we don't need to do a call. Um, that 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 sometimes can helps. 
Um, cool. Uh, okay, so let's just move on. And I, I do see Abigail, Tedas, and, and uh, Victor, you asked some questions about um, kind of what candidates to, can do to um, uh, position themselves. So maybe we can just add, ask one general question, like if you're a, a developer who wants to get a remote job, what can you do from the candidate point of view to um, help uh, your chance, increase your chances? Um, yeah, I can, I can take a first step. So I think as a candidate, um, like, like I, I think, um, I mean, like, I mean, there's the general interview, uh, uh, you know, like preparing for general interview, like that's no different. You got to research the company. You got to look at what they are looking for and what's your strength and weakness and you know, all that stuff. Right. So, so there's nothing different really there. I think I think w w one thing that can help you a little can help you a little bit is uh, you know if you don't have any remote working experience but you want to try this out then uh, do some research on you know remote practice and how companies don't conduct remote and read the GitLab you know remote manifesto so so just get yourself familiar with the whole remote concept you may even try you know uh, uh, you know try some experiments like you know set up your daily routine to set yourself up for, you know, to become an effective remote worker. And I think some companies who are, I see a lot of companies who are remote only, you know, they do ask questions about how effective you would be as a remote engineer. And in that case, you know, you better to prepare for that, right? And, uh, and then, you know, also be honest, like, you know, if I haven't done it before, that's fine. As long as you have that mentality, you've done the research, you really want to give it a try. Yeah, for me, like when I get an application that comes in, I don't really kind of differentiate, you know, you know, especially with this whole situation that everyone kind of is forced into the whole remote atmosphere. Um, I really don't look at more of like the remote aspect of the candidate. It's more like I look at what they're saying to me in their application. Um, in today's day and age, it's so easy to just copy and paste, click a button, and you know, it's low effort. You can apply to hundreds and hundreds of jobs um, and just use a shotgun method and get a bunch of responses back. You know, it won't be 100%, but if you get 10 out of 100, that's still pretty good, right? Um, but for me, like I look at these applications and it's very obvious if somebody did do a copy and paste. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, it's just like, if you're gonna waste your time there, or sorry, if you're gonna waste my time looking through this whole like copy and paste wall of text, um, why, what are you going to do when you're actually on the job, you know? Um, so I like it when the application comes in, it's short, it's concise, it's directed to what we are putting into the job description. Like if I'm talking about, you know, you need Golang or you need like Python and your skills are in Java, like why are you copying, pasting and applying, right? Like, yeah, sure, take a stab at it, try out, but really cater that application towards us. So if you don't have, say, the hard skills, like a language difference um, between Java and Golang and whatever, then maybe talk more about the entrepreneurial side of things. Like, yeah, I did a, you did maybe like a side project. This is really cool. This is relevant to commit somehow. Uh, and really give me sort of like that understanding of who you are. Um, just, you know, give me your GitHub profile, give your LinkedIn profile so I can just further look into who you are and what you've done in your, 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 your life and your career so that I can differentiate you from, you know, the hundreds and hundreds of applications that come in when we do post a job. Awesome. Thank, thanks, Fong. That's a great answer. Um, and, and what about some some pitfalls to avoid when, when hiring remote? Like, so let's go back to the company side. Um, what are some mistakes that you guys have, have maybe made yourselves or seen other companies make um, that have uh, hindered them uh, in, in the in remote hiring process? Yeah. Earlier on, like what we were trying to or like I guess for my career when I was trying to sort of get these Zoom meetings or online meetings set up, it's there's a lot of back and forth. It's like you know, hey, yeah, we're interested in you. What's a good time? And then they're like, oh, okay, yeah, I'm 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 happy to have a chat. How's next week? And then you get back to them with another email that says, uh, how's next week on Tuesday? And then they come back and say, how's next week on Tuesday? Maybe like two o'clock or something like that. And that back and forth is really not a good experience for I am neither you nor the candidate. And so we've been having a lot of opportunity, or not opportunity, a lot of um, uh, benefits with using a lot of online tools like uh, Calendly. Like for me, if I'm interested in the candidate, I just kind of 
send them my link and say, hey, let's have a chat. Why don't you pick a time that's best for you and me? And Calendly already kind of knows my schedule. So it's a single touch point. Uh, they choose a time and we jump on a call and have a chat. So shortening that time from like a week to maybe like a day of mm -hmm. back and forth has been really good on the experience on both sides. Yeah, and I, I think from my perspective, um, I did like uh, one, the first thing is be aware that remote remote company is absolutely different from just send people to home and work from home. <laughs> like that, mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's like remote is way, way, way more than that. So it's not just like, oh, I want to transition to remote. Now everybody work from home tomorrow. It, it, it'll be the worst thing that, that you can you can do. It, it really kind of look at, you know, like, first of all, start small. You know, like try some experiment if you're transitioning, you know, not the whole company, but, you know, some some like small team so they can figure out the kinks, the, especially the unique situation. Every company is different. You know, figure out the, the, the problems along the way and improve them and learn from the others. And, and also think about time zone, right? Time zone matters, right? You know, like having the same or similar time zone, you know, begin with that. So instead of uh, if you're a Vancouver company, you know, maybe not hire from like European, you know, Europe yet. Maybe try, you know, like US and South America, you know, mm. you know, in, in a similar time zone. Start small, you know, don't don't eat the whole thing at the same time. But on the other hand, you know, my my other advice, you know, like I've seen some companies making the mistake is, you know, they start, they just get started, two or three founders and a technical employee. And they're like, you know, like, let's not worry about remote. Let's just, let's just make, make things happen right now. And we'll think about remote later. And my advice to them is actually think, think about remote now, today, because the longer you wait, the harder it yeah. gets to transition. And mm -hmm. you're doing yourself a favor to force yourself to do it remotely. And, and it may not be as hard as you, as you think, right? You know, commit is built pretty much from remote, you know, as a remote company from day one. And we are growing pretty nicely. I think you know overall we are doing pretty well, and if you do that from day one, you're doing yourself a favor mm -hmm. and, and set set yourself up for long term success. Yeah, and to extend on top of that, there's um, it, it's it comes back to everything we talked about before with building it from the ground up with the fundamentals and embedding it directly into your culture. Um, there's a lot of people that kind of say, oh yeah, remote is just going online, doing virtual calls and things like that, but you're losing a lot of aspects of that physical closeness that you had before. Um, and this ties into sort of mental health. Like there's a lot of the times where you're kind of isolated in your room for long periods of time. And it's just kind of like, you know, I don't see people, I'm kind of chatting, but these are just texts on an app that I see. And a lot of the times mm -hmm. people don't like it because they feel so alone. Um, and to have the culture built around remote really helped us out a lot because you know you're addressing these kinds of issues and mm -hmm. uh, at commit we everybody has that built in i mean we have a mental health channel uh we build our processes around people having those face-to-face -face times um simulating some of the, the physical aspects that we had before and to really building the culture around a very healthy remote atmosphere awesome yeah i, I was i wanted to dive deep into that what um kind of you, you really get some good tips there, Fong, but like practical things like having a mental health channel. But like, what does it mean to think about remote first? Like, what would be maybe three or four things that are must haves to be in place um, to be able to have a successful remote uh, tech company? Uh, I mean, the first thing I can think of is uh, a long time ago, you know, when I was working at Qualcomm, Qualcomm's like a big company, and there was a situation where Somebody messaged me, I've never met him before, and he kind of asked me a question about a part of like the chip. And he kind of started with, hey, Fong, how's it going? And I'm like, okay, yeah, um, hey, how's it going? Um, you know, what did you reach out for, things like that. Mm -hmm. And then like four hours later, he came back and he's like, oh yeah, I, I asked somebody for help about something and he told me to reach out to you. And I'm like, okay, cool, we're gonna help you with. And then another four hours later, you know, you, you can already see that the, the 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 flow here and we went back and forth and back and forth until we actually found uh what i could help that person with and it took like a full day like the next day mm -hmm. he finally got to what he needed help with and you know having that back and forth is just not good like you're not going to do well in your productivity if you have that kind of communication so you need to build sort of this whole mindset of asynchronous communication within your culture 
-hmm. and so at commit, you know, what we do is we embrace that and we encourage people to sort of write, uh, to over communicate, to write paragraphs and paragraphs of, you know, if they have a problem, what their problem is, uh, what they've tried, some solutions that maybe they, they're not clear on, um, and then what you can help them with. And so it's a circuitous. So when you read this sort of, you know, it looks like an essay, but you read it and you know exactly what's going on and you know exactly what to do to help. And you can reply with another essay and they can just go away and figure it out themselves or something like that um, because they can figure it out themselves. They have all the information too. So like that's mm -hmm. the one thing I would say. I don't know about three and four, but the one number one thing I say is just asynchronous communication, over communicate, give as much information as possible when you're you're talking. Yeah, nice. yeah, nice. yeah. I think I, th I think you know my 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 suggestion is to think about building out a uh, you know if there's only one thing that you need to do, like it's developing over time like a, a manual, right? <laughs> you know, for the company, for everyone to subscribe to to figure out how to do like like what what the company embrace when it comes to what is the principle what is the processes you know uh, uh what are the you know object objectives and it's kind of like the GitLab you know manifesto but mm -hmm. you know adopting that and make it your make it your own version you know at commit mm -hmm. we we don't have like official manual but we develop documentation over time so that okay. people get exposed to and learn from and mm -hmm. then this is much like as part of the onboarding right new engineer join us and then uh on the first day or two they, they will read the onboarding guide and part of it is remote working manual and how do we conduct that so you have a, a consistent visible you know a, a transparent way that everybody understand how what, what's ex, what's the expectation from them and from the company you know to work together in, in a remote environment very cool yes i just posted the link to the the gitlab hand, uh, gitlab handbook which uh, mm -hmm. also we, we use definitely use as inspiration you can see a lot of talks by uh their, their founder uh, explaining how they use it. And I think it's, it's a really um, important uh, document on, on the internet. Um, uh, what what uh, software do you guys use for yours? Is it a Google Docs? Are you guys using Notion? Or uh, what's the like tool that you might we, use? We, we try a lot of different things. And mm -hmm. I think, as I mentioned earlier, there are so many startups that are pumping out new tools. It's, uh, it's kind of interesting time, you know, like the, the whole evolution and innovation behind it. Yeah, I mean, we, we use, like, I think we, we use pretty standard tools, nothing fancy, like Airtable, Notion, mm -hmm. obviously Slack and Zoom and Google Hangout. Uh, you know, I mentioned Icebreaker and Donuts. Um, yeah, I mean, a bunch of plugins within Slack. And the phone actually write his own plugin as well, <laughs> like a bot, yeah. you know, that nags people, you know. <laughs> like it's, uh, it, it, yeah, it's just a var variety of things. And I think keep it open-minded and, and try new things as well. because. We are at a time where there's a, so much innovation going on. Like, there's not going to be just one solution you're going to deal with. Mm -hmm. You stick with for for the next few years. Yeah, there's no like one size fits all kind of solution here. It's just sort of you got to look at your culture, you got to look at your company, and you got to look at the things that you're trying to solve within your company, and then choose the best tools to solve those problems. So like, I can tell you right now, you know, we will use Calendly, we'll use Notion, and things like that. But this might not work for you, right? You really got to dig deep and figure out what you need and then use the correct tools for it. Awesome. Yeah, definitely. Um, we use Confluence on our side, um, mm -hmm. just for everyone to know, it's uh, part of the Atlassian family. But uh, yeah, I uh, th thought about Notion as well. Um, but again, it's not really about the tool for me. I found it's, it's more about using something that you'll get engagement from. So is, if, if that's simply just a Google, Google Doc and people will, will use that because they're comfortable with it, that's how we started and then we moved to Confluence later. Um, but in a remote environment, or I guess any environment really, but especially in a remote environment, environment, you want something that's easy to use that people can kind of intuitively get into um, and uh, that they actually will use because if, if not, then they're just going to be kind of lost and, and asking for help and having a bad experience, especially if they're in a different time zone and you have to waste time for some, someone's online that can answer their question, et cetera. Uh, very cool. Okay. Uh, well, I think that's it for my questions. Um, or actually, no, I do have one, one more question, which is what are your kind of predictions and thoughts on remote work? Do you think it's here to stay? What do you think <laughs> is going to happen post COVID? Uh, where do you see this trend going um, in the next three, five years? Yeah, I can take a step. I mean, like I'm a, like I build commit as a business based on the premises that remote is the future. 
right? And if you remote doesn't, if it's not the future, then my company will fail miserably. So, <laughs> so, so, so I think, you know, uh, uh, I, I really believe that for knowledge workers in the future, geolocation and opportunity will be fully decoupled. That's going to happen in the next five, 10, 20 years, however long. And remote is a big part of that. It's, there's just no reason that opportunity and geolocation needs to be coupled. Like, that doesn't just don't make any sense, right? Mm -hmm. So, so, so I think I think you know I think you know it's just like you know people need to build a highway, you know, to get us there, and and we are doing that. People are doing that. So, so I think today there is a like if you are starting as a remote company, you are giving yourself an edge for the next few years, and you're gonna you can you can take advantage of that edge. And for those who don't, you know those. Those who do will will eat your lunch. You <laughs> know, that's kind of that's kind of how I look at it, right? And so I, I think I'll just end with a story. Like one of our startup clients that we're working with um, is from Toronto. It's a small, it's an early stage startup. The founder wasn't really, you know, uh, interested in remote at the beginning, but we kind of somehow convinced the founder, hey, you know, we have engineers in Vancouver. You know, three hour difference is not that much. Give it a try, right? Risk free. Try us, right? And so, 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 so he took a leap of faith and he tried one of our engineers. And uh, a couple of months later, um, he decided to hire the engineer as a full time employee and made him a, a technical lead. And then uh, just lately, he made him a co founder and a, and a CTO for that company. And, wow. and but, 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 but at the same time, you know, once the first engineer worked, the founder was still not quite convinced. He was like, yeah, like in the future, we'll, we'll keep hiring engineers in Toronto, not Vancouver. And then a month later, he hired another engineer from Vancouver. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah, so it's just like, you know, like, because he loved the talent, right? It doesn't matter where the engineer is, right? And then, uh, and then uh, two months later, COVID-19 happened. And then uh, he texts me, oh, Bayer, like, you know, being, being, a, being a remote company, this is probably the best thing ever uh, happened to us ever so far. You know, like the whole transition was so smooth. Nothing really affected us. Mm -hmm. we, are, we, are, we keep going, right? So I think, I think you know, this is an interesting story that, that tells me you're going to see more and more people doing this. There's no going back. Yeah, yeah. especially with the whole COVID situation. Like, everyone's gotten a taste. And, you know, after all this blows over, there's going to be um, a sizable chunk of companies who are going to remain remote because they don't know when the next pandemic is going to happen. They don't know when the next... Uh, world crisis is going to happen and so just staying remote just makes sense and if you really think about it like I worked in a startup where uh, they were in downtown Toronto and the rents for the year was three hundred thousand dollars and so with three hundred thousand dollars like you can hire I don't know depending on skill set and level but like two to five engineers right like would if you're a startup would you rather have the engineering talent or would you rather have some swanky space downtown that people might hate going to that you might not even use if there's like a world crisis, right? So yeah, I think the, 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 the path forward is very clear. Yeah, and then I think if you look at the long-term trend, any major tech hub becomes less and less livable, you know, <laughs> like, you know, like affordability from, from that perspective. And uh, people like just in Vancouver, you know, I've, I've, I have so many people close to me they moved out of Vancouver, right? To Squamish, to the island, to the mm -hmm. in, to the interiors. And yeah, what's your option? You know, if you, you either lose those people or embrace them and work and have them work remotely, right? Yeah. So yeah. I'm pretty sure that happens. The same thing happens in, in San Francisco, Toronto, New York, Boston. It's the same thing. Yeah, no, exactly. Um, I think that that one that last aspect you mentioned about having giving people the option to live anywhere they want. So you know, the, they can maybe have a little bit bigger of a house and a yard and all these kind of things, lower cost of living, um, and, and they don't have that, that commute. Um, I personally also, you know, it's been five years and I just can't see myself going back and um, to do it doing it any other way. So I think, yeah, we're, we're all in agreement on this one. Um, great stuff. Um, you know, Fong Bear, thanks again for, for taking your time to, to hang out with us and answer some questions. Guys, we, we still have a few minutes here in the webinar. If you do have questions, um, uh david colin rachel uh emily Jeanette, uh, uh virginie uh, i think i'm saying it wrong but holly uh, abigail guys um really appreciate you spending your time with us any questions thoughts concerns uh we'll be happy to answer them for the next few minutes um and uh go from there
Okay, well, if you guys don't have any other questions, uh, I do just wanna say that we have another webinar in the series. This is actually part of a series. We're calling it the CXO series, CX, CXO chat. Uh, we're having, um, <laughs> I'm glad I said it right, Virginia. Um, where we're having um, different uh, co-founders, um, CXOs, so different COO, CTO, et cetera, positions, um, talking about their experience with remote work and generally in, um, you know, hiring uh, remotely, et cetera. Uh, the next one we have is a webinar about transitioning to remote work. So it's a company called Skywatch from Waterloo that wasn't remote um, and then moved to remote over the last, let's say, six months to a year. Uh, and they're gonna talk about their experience and what they did to make that transition happen smoothly. Uh, and now they're, they're a fully remote team also. Um, so yeah, if you guys can, can um, sign up there, just, just put the link in the chat. Uh, happening later on this month, I think in the 24th or 25th of May. Um, again, thanks everyone for, for hanging out with us and uh, Fong Bear, thank you so much for sharing your, your wisdom with us. Um, hope everything's going well on your side or continues to go, go well on your side. Actually, Abigail asking if you're recruiting, so maybe you have uh, some potential talent for your team here. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we are, we are you know, for Commit, we are constantly uh, bringing new engineer partners into Commit. So uh, definitely reach out to us. Yeah, I just and, 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 yeah, 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 and Ilya, you know, uh, uh, thanks again for having us here. Yeah, my pleasure. I just I just called, copied and pasted the link in the chat, guys. For if you want to check out commits, I'm sure uh, both Bear and Fong would be happy to connect with you guys on on Twitter, LinkedIn, all the different channels. Um, and yeah, have a great rest of the day, everyone. Thanks again, and we'll, we'll talk soon. Thanks, everybody. Thank thanks, Ilya. It's been a blast. Yeah, my pleasure. Take care, guys. Bye. Bye.